initial quote, coastal storms can be one of the most destructive natural hazards. In coastal cities, they can disrupt activities and affect large parts of the population. They can also cause major economic damage and often pose a threat to human lives. The problem of understanding the physical process operating during a storm and predicting their impact is relevant for scientists and has clear societal implications. The term storm can be defined as a disturbance of the atmosphere marked by winds and usually by rainfall, snow, hail, sleet or thunder and lightning. Coastal storms definitions may include several important features that make them unique from other storm types. These features include location of atmosphere disturbance, diversity of environments, environmental response to storms, timing and duration, and of course the maritime component of the storm. The Beaufort scale in the early 1980s, Sir Francis Beaufort proposed a system of standardizing the observation of sea conditions by ships using a consistent language according to a 13-point scale. In terms of sea state, the Beaufort scale specifically identifies storm condition as very high waves with overhanging crests. Sea surface takes on white appearance as fall in great patches is blown in very dense streaks. Rolling of sea is heavy and visibility is reduced. But there is some problem. Beaufort scale serves as a practical guide for use in weather forecasts and seafaring. Its application to storms on the coastline is somewhat limited because the focus is on the local conditions and does not include the influence of swell waves that have moved outside their area of generation. And other topics may be important. As sea and swell waves approach the shore, the type of coastal environment plays a major role in determining how the coastline responds. On coasts, usually susceptible to low energy wave conditions like estuaries and bays, even relatively small waves, example 0.5 meters, can induce and promote significant changes to the coastal environment. On the other hand, in high energy coastlines, which are exposed to year round significant wave heights over 2.5 meters, waves that can induce significant changes in an estuary have negligible impacts. The total water level, TWL, represents the sum of both astronomical tides and non-tidal residuals, also known as tidal anomalies. Non-tidal residuals can occur on the coastline due to a variety of factors, 
such as storm surge, wave setup, complex tide surge interactions and freshwater input. TWL is expressed as a function of time, where Z is the mean sea level, T is the tidal component and R represents non-tidal residuals. The timing and duration of a storm event can also be, um, be an important factor contribution to a identification of a coastal storm. This image can highlight the differences in the storm occurrence depending on the type of water level threshold adopted. It presents a hypothetical scenario whereby a coastal storm has been identified from the same water level time series using both the TWL and the R thresholds. As indicated by the shaded regions in the upper graph and the lower graph, both the timing and duration of the storm differ significantly between the two threshold types. In the case of defining the event based on a air trash in the upper graph, the storm remains above the selected 1 meter threshold for a period of 11 hours. The fact that this event commences at a period of relatively low tide, however, means that when considering only the TWL, the event only became a storm according to this definition, TWL trash above 2 meters, following the onset of high tide some 6 hours later. The duration of the storm in the lower panel, in the lower graph, is also considerably shorter. Now we can use a general coastal storm definition as being a meteorologically induced disturbance to the local maritime conditions that has the potential to significantly alter the underlying morphology and expose the backshore to waves, currents and or inundation. Early 2017. Coastal storms are usually associated with the passage of cyclonic systems, such as tropical or extratropical cyclone, which can strike the coastline directly or track at a sufficient distance from the coast to influence the local maritime conditions. In this image, we see a storm moving towards the coast. And this example illustrates that below the storm's eye, there is a wind driving and pressure driving surge. On the ocean side, the water flows away without raising sea level too much. In the landward side, as the water approaches land, it piles up, creating the so-called storm surge. And this is pretty much perceptible from the coast. The disturbance to the local maritime condition during a coastal storm must be of sufficient magnitude that the underlying morphology can be significantly altered from its model or everyday form. The coastal backshore which under normal conditions is protected from waves, currents and inundation, can, in the event of a coastal storm, be suddenly exposed to these processes. This exposure may occur over a brief period of time during the actual coastal storm event. Storminess is a concept that addresses the temporal patterns and trends of storm arrivals 
at a particular coastal region. It takes into account the frequency of coastal storms arriving over the year, the timing of a storm arrivals, example regular or irregular intervals or seasonal patterns, the teleconnections with large-scale climate patterns like El Niño or La Niña oscillations, the directional shift of coastal storms, trends in coastal storm extremes, and the effects of climate change. The various ways taken to access the storminess of a coastal region can be summarized into two main approaches. The first one is the synoptic climatological approach, and the second one is a statistical approach. Let's see both of them. The synoptic climatological approach involves the pairing of regional synoptic information such as storm tracks and sea level pressure data with coastal based observation like instrumental records, handcast data, historical reports, etc. for the particular coastal region of interest. To illustrate the image on the left so a sea level pressure chart made by the Brazilian Navy for the Brazilian coastal region and in its center shows a low pressure system named as a extratropical cyclone that is also illustrated on the image on the right and these atmospheric systems over the South Atlantic induce the majority of coastal storms that attacks Brazilian coastline. The statistical approach focuses purely on the coastal-based observational data and uses statistical methods to separate individual storm events from quiescent or non-storm periods. This approach is objective and capable of quantifying coastal storm variability across entire regions. For instance, these two images show examples of the statistical approach. On the left, there's a storm event time series that occurred in April 2010 on a segment of the Brazilian southeastern coast. There's also some maps showing the storm event's apex with a wave reaching some local beaches with distinct heights. The image on the right shows a table summarizing storm events for this particular Brazilian coastal stress between 2003 and 2014. The variables are the number of storm events, mean coastal storm duration, mean significant wave height, mean wave direction, and maximum wave height. Also, there is some monthly based record of these variables. Identifying coastal storms from wave time series. A common means of identifying coastal storm events for a particular coastal location is through statistical analysis of the significant wave height, HS, time series. This is usually undertaken through the application of the so-called POT, peaks over threshold method, which has its origin in extreme values analysis. Let's take a look at this graph to some concepts of the POT method, where P is the peak significant wave height of the storm, D is the minimum storm duration, usually in hours. I is the meteorological independence criterion. 
and H trash is the storm wave height threshold. Another useful way of identifying coastal storms is from water level time series and this approach is similar to the previous one and the key question is whether or not to base classifications on the total water levels or to eliminate tidal variability and use the non-tidal residuals. For studies focused on coastal storm impacts or for communicating coastal storm hazards to the community, that is something very important. It is the TWL that dictates the exposure of the back shore to inundation. And maybe this is a useful way of communicating coastal hazards. Now, uh, we are going to talk about synoptic systems and coastal storms. There are two main synoptic systems that are responsible for the vast majority of coastal storms. These are the tropical cyclones and the extratropical cyclones. Let's see something about them. The tropical cyclones are intense, low-pressure systems that consist of strong winds spiraling around a warm central core. They go by a variety of names according to their wind strength and the region of the world in which they occur. Tropical storm is characterized by wind speeds between 17 and 32 meters per second, and hurricanes or typhoons or even tropical cyclones, the wind speed excess 32 meters per second. The term tropical cyclone or TC is a broad term and typically used collectively to represent all these cyclonic system types. Let's see two examples. The term extratropical cyclones reflect a broad class of cold core cyclones, including lows, depressions, and frontal systems that draw their energy from temperature gradients in the atmosphere. They form in the mid-latitudes and tend to follow a zonal west-east path across the globe. The strongest extratropical cyclones occur during the winter months when atmospheric temperature differences are pronounced. In comparison with tropical cyclones, the extratropical cyclones are much larger and slower moving systems. They are also much more widespread and frequent than tropical cyclones. Gulev and his collaborators in 2001 estimated an average of 234 extratropical cyclones forming over the northern hemisphere winter. And Simons and Key, 1999, estimated some 2.5 thousand to 2.9 thousand extratropical cyclones forming annually in the southern hemisphere. Let's see two examples of extratropical cyclones.
The term storm surge refers to the sudden increase in water levels associated with certain coastal storms that can have catastrophic consequences for low-lying coastlines. The rapid onset of high water levels is considered the most destructive component of tropical and extratropical cyclones in a lesser extent. The storm surge depends on interactions between meteorological factors, example radial wind speeds, the speed of the cyclone system itself, and coastal setting in which the surge occur, example angle of cyclone approach relatively to the coastline, width and slope of the coastal shelf, local features as coastal dunes and vegetation, and etc. Storm surge is more effective with the sum of high energy waves formed by cyclones plus strong onshore winds and spring tides. Let's see some examples of an average coastal storm in southeastern Brazil that's nearby home for me. In this Im image, we can see the coast of south and southeastern Brazil in black and the colors represent wave heights that during the apex of the storm reached uh, something about 5 meters of significant wave height. The storm passage was for some kind of 12 hours and at some point they reached too close the coast. And at this moment, we have this second image. There is a footage made by, uh, by drone images. And we can see some region uh, that is named Praia Grande, like Big Beach, that is in, in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. In this image, we can see the first page of an old newspaper and famous newspaper in Brazil, that is Journal of Brazil, and they are saying that giant waves in Rio. This kind uh, is a this is a kind of a sensationalism. That is a type of news report that encourages biased impressions of events, and we definitely don't need them. The renewable energy industry is definitely interested in the knowledge of the highest wave heights over the ocean. They are interested in the global wave energy potential. They are interested in map this. And this picture was taken by me in the Marine Aquarium Museum in the Plymouth, UK, some years ago and they can give us the notion that the highest wave, waves over the oceans are in the southern hemisphere and some of them are in the North Atlantic. There are some other highest waves in the North Atl Pacific also. The coastal and oceanic engineering industry is also interested, or very interested, in this knowledge about the giant waves over the ocean. This map shows um, results of the Stellan Carey's work in 2005, 
who was estimating this 100-year return values for significant wave heights over the global ocean. And it shows that uh, major values occur in the North Atlantic and the North, North Pacific, with reaching 21 to 25 meters. That is in a 100-year period. This is the highest wave that can be seen at these waters. The insurance and reinsurance industry is another industry that maybe it's very interested in the knowledge about the giant waves on the ocean, on the global ocean. This map shows a global distribution of accidents with large ships between 1995 and 1999. And the black dots over the, the map show the position of ship accidents. The source of this map is Lloyd's Maritime Information Services. Lloyd's is the greatest insurance company of the Western. In the same context, the shipping industry is another industry very interested in the knowledge about giant waves over the ocean. This is because the oceanic navigation in rough seas is a reality and the ships must be prepared for the design of ships must be prepared for these giant waves that can be encountered during their duty. surf industry is one of the fastest growing action sport industries in the world and is worth around 10 billion dollars. The reason why surfing became a multi-million dollar sports industry is that brands appeal to consumers emotions and dreams in a very effective way but they only sell clothes. In these images we can see the big wave surfing. Big wave surfing uses the knowledge of the greatest coastal or oceanic storms to predict where are the competitions will take place over um, the globe. Mostly the giant waves reaching a coastline is on Nazare Beach in northern Portugal. This is an illustrated example of ROG or freak wave detection. The, the wave was detected from satellite measurements on the 20th of August 1996 by the European Space Agency. The maximum wave height reached 29.8 meters. Besides, that is very interesting to notice that the ratio between maximum wave height over the significant wave height was 2.9. In other words, the freak wave can be three times higher than the average wave conditions at the moment. And it is very unlikely that science can predict where and when this is going to happen. Recently, the highest wave recorded in the Southern Hemisphere was disclosed by the company Met Ocean Solutions. 
This occurred on the 17th of May 2017 nearby New Zealand. The maximum wave height reached 19.4 meters with a peak period of 17 seconds. This wave had almost double the significant wave heights during average wave conditions. And then, almost one year later, on the 19th of May 2018, the same company measured another high wave in the Southern Ocean that is currently a world record for the Southern Hemisphere. The wave reached 23.8 meters and had a period of 16.7 seconds during a sea state where significant wave heights were about 15 meters. These are some of the results of a paper published by Young and Ribal in 2019. They study the global trends in extremes of HS, significant wave height, and U10, wind speed at 10 meters above the surface, over the global ocean during the period from 1985 and 2018. Red areas in the map indicate increasing values, while blue indicates decreasing values. On the last 30 years, the average global extreme wind speed increased by 8%, and extremely global significant wave height average increased by 5%. Now, we are going to talk about some of the indicators of coastal storm severity. In terms of tropical cyclones, severity commonly is communicated by the Saffir-Simpson hurricane wind scale. This scale ranks cyclone severity into one of five categories based on the maximum one minute sustained wind speeds. Here's the scale. In category 1, the surge is 4 or 5 feet, maybe 1.5 to 2 meters. Winds are um, over 64 to 82 knots. And no real damage to building structures. Damage is primarily to uncharged mobile homes. Shrubbery and trees, also some coastal flooding and minor pier damage. At the other end, the category 5 is the surge is greater than 19 feet. Winds are greater than 165 miles per hour or 135 knots. There is complete roof failure on many residence and industrial buildings. Some complete building failures with small utility buildings blown over or away. Flooding causes major damage to lower floors of all structures near the shoreline. Massive evacuation of residential areas may be required. Categories 2, 3, and 4 in that order just accounts for the escalating of the intensity of the hurricane, the escalating of wind speed, the escalating or the increasing of the total water level floods, and that's a useful scale but is useful only for hurricanes mainly in the U.S. So we need another other scales that takes into account other types of coastal storms.
estimates on storms return periods can be quite useful. This assessment entails an extreme value analysis of the historical data and means that coastal storm severity can be communicated in terms of its average recurrence, interval, or annual exceedance probability. This graph, produced by Campos 2009, estimates the extreme values of significant wave height in the returns periods functions up to 100 years. The author used handcast and buoy data. Inside the graph, the red line indicates the estimates using cyclones handcast data. The blue line indicates the estimates using anti-cyclone handcast data. And the black solid line indicates the estimates using buoy data that is mostly more reliable. In, in, this is for the Southern Atlantic, nearby southeastern Brazil, and it's very useful for the oil and gas industry that operates in this region. Another scale is the ETC storm scale where Dolan and Davis in 1992 developed a storm intensity classification specifically for longer duration extratropical coastal storms. The duration of storm event was taken into account in the severity classification by integrating the wave energy over the whole event and it's given by E where E is the storm energy content and T1 and T2 correspond to the start and end times of the storm event determined by the up and down crossings of the storm threshold, age thresh. The storm severity levels were subsequently developed based on ranges of these E values Using, using a five-category system analogous to the uh, Sapphire simpson hurricane wind scale. Note that this system was developed firstly for the east coast of the USA only and is therefore kind of site-specific. Other authors uh, like Mendoza, it, it, his collaborators in 2011, apply the same classification method, methodology to the coastline of Catalonia and resulted in different ranges of E for each storm class. This, this table shows the coastal storm severity classifications for the coastlines of the east coast of the USA and Catalonia, Spain, based on the total storm energy methodology as explained. The storm class 1, the description is weak and there's the E value that is below 72 and for Catalonia between 24 and 250. The, the storm class 2 is moderate, the storm class 3 is significant, the storm class 4 is severe and the storm class 5 is extreme. And there is the variations on the E values. Maybe this is an interesting scale to apply locally for the coastal regions of your interest. Enough for today. See you soon. Take care and be safe.